So now that we've outlined what a channel strip does and how to use them, let's expand that and think about a full analog workflow. So rather than using digital recording, what you'd have had to have done beforehand in a fully analog situation would be use some sort of magnetic storage device, so a multi-track tape machine. And then when you wanted to reproduce that for mix down, you would have to send the outputs of each of these channels of the multi-track tape machine to individual channels of the mixing console. And it would be the mixing console's job to not only process things, patch in any outboard, but also to sum everything down so that it could be sent out to a, another tape machine that's job was to just capture the fully finished mix. And these are called two track tape machines because they have two tracks, a left and a right for a stereo mix down. So if we were to reproduce this workflow in the box, okay, in digital technology, we would need plugins that emulate the multi-track tape machine that we had put on all of the individual channels. We would need channel strips that emulated the um, channel strip of the console itself that you'd be using. You'd want potentially some digital emulations of some classic outboard gear that you might have patched in on the inserts of the console. And then you need an emulation of the summing of that particular console. So the extra harmonic distortion and other non-linearities that happen on an analog console. From there, what you would want to also do is to emulate the sound of the two-track tape machine. So the um, tape machine that captures the whole mix. So that's the workflow that we need to think about. So um, let's go ahead and go back into Pro Tools here. And what we're going to do is we're going to add tape machine emulations. And I'm going to add these to every single channel that we have a mix hub on. So I'm not going to worry about these three individual kicks because if I was using a tape machine anyway, I'd likely have, when this was recorded, sum those down to one channel anyway. Because if you have, you know, 15, 16 channels of drums, that leaves very little space to have um, anything else on the tape if you've only got 24 channels. So um, I'm just going to go ahead and I've basically got all the individual channels here. And I'm uh, not going to include the mix bus on that. And I'm just going to load up a tape machine here. So I am going to load up the Kramer tape. Here we go. Cool. So now this is emulating the sonic characteristics of a tape machine. Okay, and whilst this is not really a tutorial to talk about tape machines in real depth, you get some sort of standardized sonic characteristics from tape machines, which is that you get what's called a head bump, which is a low frequency buildup, you know, in the around the uh, 100 to 250 hertz range. And you also get a roll off of the top frequency. So you get this extra warming characteristic from two things. You get the um, bump in the low end and the roll off of the top. Uh, this can make sounds a little less fatiguing to listen to and bigger and fatter. And the other thing that you get from tape machines is a less exaggerated transient. So it kind of rolls off the transient, which is great for making drums and other things sound fatter. Um, and finally, you also get something called wow and flutter, which is kind of a, a, a pitch modulation um, based on the fact that the tape machine itself uh, it's a mechanical device, so as it's running, the speed might change slightly or it might not be passing over the tape heads just completely perpendicular. Um, so that can kind of cause some sort of modulation. So these are little effects that tape machines and other mechanical devices have that make them less perfect than digital audio recording. And people grew to like that after a while. So we've loaded this up and I'm going to keep it on its default settings. Okay, And all we're going to do is kind of work on the recording level and the playback level to kind of hit them at their optimal level. Now, any sustained instrument, you should be looking to get nearer zero and any kind of transient like percussive sources, you might want to have them a bit lower so that they um, uh, all feel at one with each other, all of the different elements that you're balancing. And this is because um, VU meters here uh, don't show peak information. They show kind of an average 
of the sound source and um, very punchy, transient, heavy material like kicks and snares tend to have a bigger disparity between their peak level and their average level. Okay, so let's just have a quick listen and let's game stage them. so there i've gone through and i've done the kind of most important instruments and kind of gain stage those into the tape and i'm just going to bypass the effects of the tape machine now if i was doing this from scratch and we hadn't done the first video where we were using the channel strips i would have preferred that sort of scenario because you are working into the sound of the tape and you're EQing based on already heard what the tape machine is doing whereas in this case adding it after is not so optimal but anyway uh, let's just turn the tape on and off Okay, so there you heard it just got a bit rounder and a bit warmer overall. The uh, drums lost a little bit of their smackiness, so but they became a little bit bigger at the same time. And that, you know, sometimes makes it easier to add even more top end to those sort of instruments. So... So now that we've emulated the sound of the multi-track tape machine and we've emulated the character of the channel strips themselves, 
let's emulate the sound of the summing characteristics of the console. So to do that, we need to load up the standard NLS channel on all of the same channels that we have the channel strip emulations on. So again, going into harmonic here and we want to go to NLS channel. Okay, so now that's loaded on to the stereo channels. I'm going to do the same thing to the mono channels. Okay, so this particular plugin is able to do um, a multitude of consoles. So we've actually got three names along the top here. We've got Spike, we've got Mike, and Nevo. So this is... Um, you know spike stent and that's his ssl console you, if you know what the consoles look like you'll be able to tell from the graphical user interface we've got mike hedges which is a tg12345 console the classic emi and we've got yoed nevo which is a more modern neve console so we're going to keep it on spike because we've been emulating a ssl all along so again this tutorial isn't about learning how to use this particular plugin in depth it's more about the workflow of these different sections so if you'd like a tutorial in depth on how to use either the tape machines or these NLS channels, let me know and I'll make one. Uh, but for now, I'm going to leave everything associated to VCA Group 1, meaning that when I mess with the drive, I can mess with the drive for all the channels together. So we've basically emulated this SSL and now I'm going to use the drive feature to extenuate those sort of harmonic distortions. <laughs> And now let's turn on and off all of these NLS channels. Okay, so hopefully what you're hearing there is just that that extra harmonic distortion kind of gels everything together, gives everything a shared sense of purpose, and everything just becomes that little bit clearer and that little bit more glued together. So listen for that one more time. Okay, so the next stage I'm going to do here is I'm going to add a um, NLS mix bus. Okay, so this is designed to emulate the master fader of the console that you're using. And I'm going to leave it on the SSL. Okay, so now we're going to emulate the sound of this whole mix going to a two-track tape machine. And I'm going to load the J37, which was strictly a multi-track tape machine from the um, early to mid-1960s. But I really like the sound of it, so I'm going to use that for the overall mix bus. And 
now I'm going to mess around with the different tape formulations to see if there's one that better suits the track. And I like the low end body that we're getting out of this 888 tape, so I'm going to leave it on that. So now we've basically emulated this whole recording chain. So let's go ahead and turn all the plugins we've put on so far on and off. Okay, so now that we've got all of that out of the way, let's think about some other things that you might want to do on an analog console. So the next thing is is to think about our effects usage. So on a typical analog console, you can't just be adding reverb on every single channel because you would quickly run out of auxiliary sense. So instead, you tended to use more shared reverbs. So in this particular case, to save a bit of time, I've gone through and I've set up several reverbs and delays that I'm going to share amongst a number of tracks. So what we've got is we've got some sort of short ambience. So again, this time is 1.1 seconds, and I might even make it a little bit um, tighter than that. We've got a medium reverb, which is 1.8. We've got a longer Hawley sound that's about three seconds and we've got an eighth note delay and we've got a slap delay and I can feed various bits of lots of instruments into those effects rather than having um, say one effect for a specific instrument okay so let's go ahead and let's start with the vocal and we'll add some various forms of effects And notice by blending these three different reverbs together, we can kind of get the sense of space right a little bit more easily than trying to just hack it with one reverb. So this ambience is just there to kind of thicken the sound overall. The medium's there to just give it a little bit of extra sustain and energy. And then the large one is like sparkle and brightness. Okay. And let me just take those on and off in solo. I give it up, we'll do it to you. I'll give you hell to pay. There'll be hell to pay. There'll be hell. So the aim is not to make it super wet. It's an aggressive sounding rock track, but it's just there to give the vocal a little bit more extra energy and a little bit of extra weight. So let's go ahead and add a little bit of slap delay now. Again, this should thicken it even more. I give it up, we'll do it to you. I'll give you hell to pay. There'll be hell to pay. And then a bit of a longer delay. I give it up, we'll do it to you. I'll give you hell to pay.
And now let's add some of the ambience and some of the mediums onto some of these drums. And I'm going to base this around the snare drum now. Okay, so now we've got a few effects in there. I'm going to be fairly light with the effects because uh, if I'm going for a bit more of an analog style thing, it might be a bit dry, uh, drier anyway, sp uh, specifically if it's from the 70s. Uh, so let's go ahead and now add a few choice bits of outboard gear. And one of the things that I'm feeling is I want to give the bass guitar just that little bit of extra uh, mid-range and extra kind of warmth. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to put a um, LA-2A on here on the insert point so let's go ahead and hopefully this should solidify the bass a little bit more Okay, so now that's sorted, I'm just going to go ahead, I'm going to make some space on my mix bus here after the summing has happened, but before the tape machine. And I'm going to add 
uh, just a couple of plugins. So first of all, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to add an SSL bus compressor because these SSL consoles had a compressor strapped across them that you could turn on that was part of the console that was there to compress the whole mix. So we're going to use a bit of that. And typically the way you'd set this is to be a slow attack and a fast release. Um, this is 30 milliseconds uh, as an attack and uh, 100 milliseconds as a release. And this is to just make the whole thing groove and, and move in tempo and in time with the music a little bit more. And then the next thing I'm going to do is add a bit of choice outboard equipment. Okay, so... Uh, I'm just going to go ahead and I'm going to load a pull tech on here, which is a classic tube EQ. Okay, and I'm just going to kind of use what I would usually use, which is just a little bit of kind of wide bandwidth at 100 and the same at somewhere between 12, uh, 10 to 16K as well. And I'll just kind of sweep this around and kind of get it so that I'm kind of adding that almost smiley face EQ that you would find in uh, a lot of mixes. Okay, so I kind of feel like it's starting to come together, but the overheads feel like there's some mid-range frequencies that are just getting in the way a little bit. So I'm just going to go ahead and I'm going to EQ these a bit. Okay, and let's have a final listen to before and after now that we've kind of modeled a whole analog chain. Another face for a sinful life. 
okay so hopefully what you're hearing is that this approach definitely has more harmonic distortion a weight and a character that the uh, initial kind of balance doesn't have now whether you want to use this classic approach or not is up to you but my usual way of working is to use elements of this and elements of modern production techniques so for instance i would not usually add a tape machine on every single channel by default i would go on a case-by-case -case basis of deciding whether it needs it um, quite often i would use a channel strip on all of these main instruments and and typically an ssl e channel is usually what i would like on a kind of uh, alt rock or hard rock track um, and for the NLS is that I would quite often use the NLS or something else that will give a bit of harmonic distortion on plenty of channels and you know on the overall mix bus I would use the majority of these plugins too um, but I don't feel like I need to be tied completely to this sort of approach so I would happily be adding more um, you know modern digital EQs to notch out very specific frequencies I would be happy to use a lot more parallel processing than uh, you typically would have done in the uh, 1970s or, or some sort of time when you were pri uh, primarily using tape. Uh, I would also be happy to use specific reverbs just for a particular instrument too, uh, rather than just using shared reverbs. So whilst this approach can be useful and it's certainly a good learning exercise, over time I think you'll find yourself gravitating towards knowing what these different parts of the chain sound like and how to add the right amount of color and just enough color to be able to do what you want to do without having to rely on this completely analog style approach.